corporation known as the Commonwealth of Taxachusetts, radiating out to the darkest corners of Al Gore's internet from our secret broadcast bunker cleverly disguised as a middle-class living room. This is Red Phil Politics. Howdy there, patriots and sleepy sheeple. Welcome back to your weekly dose of red pill politics. I am your opinionated and abrasive host, Dave Runs with Scissors Copaz. I'd like to welcome you all to the show tonight. And as always, this most beautiful flower beside me, none other than my most beautiful wife and quippy co-host, Cynthia. How is your everything, honey bear? Well, since about an hour ago, everything's fabulous. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> We're all pumped up for the show. That's right. Things looking good. We got all kinds of good stuff going on here for the folks tonight. Amen. Uh, pop in, see how things are going over in the chat room. Say hi to the folks there. Um, yeah. We got IPM Nation. We are streaming live every Sunday night from 7 to 9 o'clock over at IPM Nation. So make sure you check us out over there. We've got a show archive there as well. We do. All kinds of uh, very diverse uh, programming going on at that particular location that you can check out. I think there's three channels uh, streaming 24 hours a day over at IPMNation.com. Pretty cool. Who we got with us? Dan, hello. Sky, so good to see you. Mickey. Helen, welcome to the room. Cheryl, howdy do. Mickey, good to see you again, brother. All right. Um, we always got uh, the usual uh, uh, great folks that pop into the chat every week and uh, contribute. And that's one of the that's things right. that we uh, really want to do here is make um, make this interactive. We all need to be uh, sharing information out there. You know, I, I learn stuff every single week. And, you know, it, it's by being open-minded, listening to what other people have to say. Okay, well, uh, Cheryl, Cheryl's saying your audio is repeating itself in the background. Oh, uh, no. I don't know why it is doing that. Um, anyone maybe else? that maybe that's on your end. I don't know, honey. Yeah, uh, check it out. Anyone else having an audio problem there? Hey, Sky. Hey, Deb. What's yeah. up? Um, yeah, we're getting green Hi. lights on our end. Uh, yeah, okay. check it out, Cheryl. We'll uh, keep looking. If anyone else is having a problem, please let us know. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, this is a group effort, man. We're all in this together, right? We are. Uh, so we ask people to contribute. Yeah. Jump right in uh, the text chat and share some links and resources. Oh, um, nobody holds back. That's good. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to agree with us all the time either. Uh, heck, you and I don't always agree on things, believe it or not. Yeah, think? I'm quite sure of these matters. So, <laughs> yeah, we, you know, uh, uh, we got to, uh, you know, put the facts out on the table and, uh, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Right. It's about the truth all the time. And, oh, you bet. You know, that kind of brings me to uh, a Absolutely couple true. of things. I want to get a little house cleaning out of the way uh, before we dive into anything. But um, hey, this Wednesday, uh, let's take these in order. Monday, uh, there's a yes. press conference by Camp Constitution. Hal Shirtliff uh, has got a couple of uh, great speakers out there doing a press conference on uh, the phony uh, man-made global warming. Oh. So uh, that is uh, Monday as tomorrow. For those of you listening live right now, February it 25th. is tomorrow, February 25th, at the State House in the Nurses Hall. And, hey, by the way, since we're talking about how Shirtliff and Camp Constitution, 
Happy birthday, birthday. brother. Wow. Today's, uh, he's uh, the birthday boy today. Amen. And so is our friend Slider. Slider comes Whoa. in the show every week, too. Nice. I think today is his birthday as well. Uh, so uh, happy birthday to you two guys. Thanks, Matt. Um, now, Appreciate Wednesday, uh, I was uh, talking with one of my colleagues in uh, the Constitution Party. He's one yes. of the uh, regional uh, of VPs, and he does a show called Constitutionally Correct. And uh, this week... He's going to be heading out to CPAC. They're going to have a, a oh. table there and a, a press table. Are you They're talking gonna... about Mr. Stuffelbean? Yes, yes, Randy Stuffelbean. Wow. Uh, uh, and know, he's uh, nice constitutionally guy. correct is his uh, show. I like him. And uh, as we were talking last week, we were, you know, just kind of talking shop and some other things, and uh, it kind of came up. And uh, I'm going to be on the show. We're going to. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're going to uh, go live on his show. We're going to talk about. Uh, CPAC and uh, the effort out there. You do that a lot. Do what a lot? You run you run people's shows a lot. Um. Yeah. Well, you know, it's about getting the word out there. Right. So uh, we're we're gonna keep uh, hey, Kristen. keep spreading the word and um, you know, sharing the love, sharing the yeah. love. Um. So yeah, w- uh, check that out Wednesday night if you haven't got nothing going on Wednesday evening. Uh, stop on over. I'll be posting some links later on. Um, up on the show page, probably my hey. personal page as well. Uh, check it out. Share it around. And speaking of sharing, uh, be sharing this uh, live link right now. Get that out on your wall or some groups, uh, some friends, you know. Get them on in the room here because uh, we do want to um, make right. sure the, the room is full. That means do it now. Uh, when Stuart <laughs> Rhodes calls in, uh, I expect Stuart in hey, about uh, 20 minutes after <laughs> the hour. Right. So we've only got about 15 more minutes to go uh, before the call comes in. Okay. Get the word out there. We're going to be talking about this new emergency order that uh, the oh, president yes. has declared. Um, yes. I mean, we got to look at things for what they are. The truth is the truth. And, you know, he is our president, and he uh, is the head of this nation, and we certainly don't want to wish ill of someone in that position, you know, which is something the radical left do. They actually wish the leader of their country ill will well they're pretty um, crazy anyway you know you, aren't they even if you don't agree with them you pray for him at night that you uh do. you know he'll be granted Absolutely. the strength and wisdom to, try, to try persevere it. on behalf mm. of the people of this country mm-hmm. um so yeah we're going to be talking about that with uh Stuart rhodes founder of oath keepers uh right around the corner um what else do we have going on oh yeah um i got some links and uh, things i like to share with you guys there's some stuff that's been going on out there that is um, rather disturbing. What? Um, there's, and I was afraid of this, you know, is that we've been seeing a lot of uh, really strange arrests and accusations and things mm, have. around sex rings and uh, pedophilia and, and ch- uh, child sex abuse and things like that. Not um, good. And, you know, how it's, you know, not just a private little thing that it's actually got a whole segment of it that's institutionalized. Well, speaking of institutions, among the, the ones that we want to be taking a look at. Yeah. And I'm going to uh, first share a link up there in the text uh, for folks that want to get involved in uh, just in the effort, the general effort of trying to uh, strengthen the sex offender laws here in the state. Important. And at the same time, making sure it's thorough. Uh, We're going to look everywhere for trends all over the place. But we were uh, seeing uh, articles come up recently, and they just, they, they, they make your blood curdle. Um, The actual institutions that are tasked with protecting kids uh, keeping them out of harm's way. Many times they're taken out of uh, out of homes. Sometimes uh, rightfully uh, troubled homes. Sometimes not. Some you know there are times where you know poverty is not a um, child abuse. It just being falling on tough times. The state has actually institutionalized and monetized um, you know the acquisition in placement and foster care of uh, children. And some of the things that I am finding are not very promising. The state is, uh, there's undocumented cases all over. These children, when they're being abused, are, you know, no one's ever even finding out about it. They're 
Uh, I'm posting some of the articles now. I want people to, you know, look at them, tuck them away, or or whatever. Kristen. Uh, But make sure uh, you read some of these because there is reason for concern. If if foster care is is placing in harm's way, um, putting kids into homes they do not belong in, uh, kids disappearing. Remember I mentioned that statistic? This is going back a few years when I checked this, so I'm sure it may have varied a little bit. But just to give you some idea, uh, you know, in scale, I think Massachusetts was second in the, the nation as far as the number of missing kids in state care. And That's alarming. Yes. It was second to Florida. Florida was number one at 1,500. Alarming. And Massachusetts, I believe, was 400. Kind of going uh, from memory, but those are the rough numbers. Um, may have and probably has changed a little bit, but those numbers in and of themselves are alarming. They're significant, and it, you know, scales like that. Come on, you you got to know there is a problem. Huge red flag. So, you know, we're reaching out. It, it, you know, this is, a, you know, again, our private group and, and those that have uh, got some light shined on to this, we're starting to hear from folks. They're coming out of the woodwork. Information is starting to shake loose. So we're going to uh, keep beating that drum. And that's a good I, thing. You know, I'm sure someone's going to listen to this uh, tonight, tomorrow, a, a month from now. And say, you know what, Um, I'm going to contact these folks. So whatever we can uh, get as far as information, um, you know, because we're we're finding a lot of parents, um, and there's some pretty impressive lawsuits flying around. We may talk about this more in more depth um, in the future, but uh, there's lawsuits Mm -hmm. going around right now by some parents that have, in my opinion, really been wronged, but. You know, if you are aware and have any information that would possibly help, please send it along. I, I posted the page up there for the Massachusetts Children's Task Correct. Force. Feel free, please. That's a, yeah. a, 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 you know, kind of an online uh, think tank for uh, tightening up these uh, sex offender right. laws here in Massachusetts. And this is a no fear zone. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this uh, is a no fear zone. About, all right. The best decisions are made on accurate information. And that's all we're looking for. We're not looking to, uh, uh, sc- you know, skew anything. We're following trends. We're following leads. And wherever these kids are being harmed, hey Richie, what uh, what is wrong? What you? has broken down? And yeah. those part of you know we can't assume just because the state has stepped in with a child that the child is safe. Oh we no, we know that now. So we're looking for problems in the private sector out in the residential neighborhoods trends that we have there but we're also looking at the institutions you know if we find out the dcf and foster care systems wind up being a meat mill uh for abused children there's going to be hell to pay it's going to be part of the reports and 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 we're going to press forward on the information we have so i'm not going to be too accusatory right now i i posted three articles up there for your consideration so you read those, you check those out, and you get back to me, and you tell me if this is uh, uh, worth um, making sure that our, our research is, is thorough and includes these particular areas. Where I, I don't think we should leave that stone unturned. That hey, Michael. Is darn hey, Paul. Sure. Uh, who we got in the room? Who we got? Richie, hello. Michael, how are you? Paul, good to see you. We have people from upstate New York. We have got, people from uh, Arkansas. We have Indiana Oath Keepers in the room. Looks like Montana's uh, president Whoa. accounted for. Amen. Mike Flynn. All right. All right. Good to see everybody. Glad True. everyone made it in the room tonight. Yeah, happy to um, have you. Got lots and lots of good stuff. We're going to be kicking around some things here pretty darn quick. Uh, as uh, we, we mentioned earlier, Stuart Rhodes, founder of Oath Keepers, is going to be calling in at about 20 minutes after 7. Hey, I took the oath, you know. You did? I did. I was up on the battle green probably about 20 feet off from Stuart's uh, left shoulder um, when the group was founded. It was wow. uh, something else. There was a big group of people there that day. I took the oath at, the, at your fourth annual Flag Day rally correct but i also took it again in dc yeah yeah i i think i've taken it every time it was offered right absolutely so um good stuff we're going to be talking it up tonight a little bit about this emergency order yeah because this is uh 
given a lot of people pause. I mean, without a doubt, we want to see the immigration, the, not the immigration. No, I'm sorry. I am I am going to uh, uh, yeah. repent of my language here. These folks that are coming up are not illegal immigrants. Yeah. All right. Im to use the word immigrants implies that they okay. wish to come to this nation um, it, to immigrate. All right. And we've defined that. There's an immigration process, a procedure um, mm. for that. Mm -hmm. They have openly denounced it, refused. So they're not immigrants. They are not attempting to immigrate. They don't wish to immigrate. They've stated they are not immigrating. Or, in or assimilate. They are illegal aliens. That's right. They are legal invaders. The ones that knock on the door, don't get me wrong, you knock on the front door, you want to, uh, you know, acclimate into the American mm -hmm. uh, uh, culture and, and do it in a way that stabilizes and strengthens our nation, good for you. I'll fight just as hard for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. But those of you that uh, are going to make your first order of business to violate our laws. But why are they violating? Screw why, that. Are they, why, are, why are they invading? Because we're allowing it. Yeah, well, there's money behind this. Hi, this is all. This is the growing pains of globalization. Hey, I mentioned Jamie. that Hi. before. That's pretty much what we got here is yeah. the growing pains of globalization. Oof. Now, I want to give a shout out. I want to thank Alex Walson. Okay. You know, a friend of mine uh, about a week ago. He sent me a friend request on Facebook, and I went and checked him out, and he we had a lot of things in common. I uh, uh, friended him, and he got a hold of me later that day. Not everyone follows up and says howdy, but, you know, this guy did, and kind of introduced himself, said he, he did some volunteer stuff with the Constitution Party, and, nice. you know, if he could ever help, let him know. Wow. So I, you know, happened to be right in the middle of working on these uh, county committees of correspondence pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So Hi, uh, I got right back to him and I said, boy, that might have been uh, uh, your biggest mistake of the week is sending me a friend request. Uh, and I put him right to work. <laughs> you're going to keep him busy. I told him we needed some uh, sure. uh, uh, simple uh, hey, but descriptive graphics uh, for the banner on each of our pages. And since they were each, uh, each of the counties in Massachusetts, we got a nice uh, backdrop of uh, the Commonwealth. Nice. With uh, the county, you know, the Essex oh, County yeah. Committee of Correspondence with Essex County highlighted. Uh, really nice and, and uh, slick, and, and he, he did it in just a day or two. Wow. So thank I just want to say you. thank you to Alex. He's thank kind you, of Alex. A, wow. a freelance. Um, a little firecracker. Uh, yeah, yeah. He just kind of runs around helping uh, the Constitution oh, Party in gosh. different states wherever he can. And, you know, it's uh, teamwork, man. It's what it's all about. So, yeah, that is, uh, you know, what we, we mentioned there about DCF and, and, you know, as we research these trends in order to strengthen and, and develop a good uh, proposal for the legislation, you know, we really got to make sure it's thorough and we're looking everywhere. We're bringing in all the information that's relevant because it is about being effective. So there's nothing that's going to be swept under the rug. And if this turns out to be a place where we need to be focusing it, it's gonna it's gonna be in there so i'm just putting the all call out for information right now i got a lot of great friends man on my list and uh they do, do a lot ordinary people do extraordinary things every damn day so that's uh kind of what we're hoping you know this is gonna you know it's gonna be a process uh but momentum's on our side and uh you know great things are happening already right. so um, get that I, any information you can into us. I can't keep up with you. You're like, yeah. wow. Yeah, our uh, ad hoc committee. We have a uh, conference call every Monday. You do. You, you hit the ground running. This Tuesday. Every, every, the, when you put your two feet on the floor. There's an organizational meeting for the town uh, group. Hey, Eggy. Eggy, welcome to the room. Cheryl, how are you? Who else we got in here tonight? We have Dennis. We have Paul. All right, Jamie. way to go. Um, nice room tonight. We, we have a nice um, room. We're That's also right. uh, simulcasting IPM Nation. We are. Streaming live every Sunday, 7 and 9 over there as well. So um, definitely be sure to check that out. It's all cool stuff. All uh -huh. right, and I think what um, we, have here? we may have our caller. Uh, guest caller coming Amen. in here tonight. As uh, promised, we uh, put the word out that uh, Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers, uh, was going to be coming in this evening. Uh, Stuart, have we got a good line there? Are we hear you okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. 
Hi, Stuart. Good deal. Excellent. Hey, nice, um, nice to have you. We just did a little uh, warm up for you. Um, we wanted to uh, let folks know ahead of time you're going to be coming out. We're going to talk a little bit about the new uh, emergency order that was issued by the president. But uh, before we get into that, uh, let me give you a few moments to uh, uh, say a little bit about yourself and Oath Keepers. Uh, well, Oath Keepers is, I found Oath Keepers 10 years ago, actually, almost 10 years ago, in 2009. And what we are is an association of both current serving and former military police, uh, firefighters, EMTs, and other first responders, as well as the dedicated citizens who we open our membership up to uh, folks who have not done prior service because we're all in this together, so they can join as well. Amen. Excellent. Uh, Cindy and I were just talking. We both take any oath, and uh, myself, I was out there with a lot of patriots that... Uh, Brist Day on uh, the Battle Green, and uh, when you founded the organization, uh, we've been uh, fans of the group for uh, for a long time, and uh, very happy to have you on the show tonight. Um, uh, very uh, good timing here. I'm glad uh, I got a hold of you when uh, we did. Here is uh, you were just on um, substituting for um, uh, on Infowars. And you had a, a very good interview with Dr. Edwin Vieira, uh, Jr. Uh, so I'm hoping we're going to be able to touch on a few things. But generally speaking, I wanted to focus on this new uh, emergency order that was issued by the president, um, specifically if it has any constitutional uh, underpinning. And secondly, I, I hate to just go out and gripe and complain without a solution, so what would be an alternative if we run into an issue where um, it just does not reach constitutional muster? Well, it's not a matter of whether it's constitutional muster. This is what Dr. Vieira and I have talked about at length with last week. Um, President Trump has very concrete constitutional authority as commander-in-chief um, and as the president to repel invasions, to suppress insurrections, and execute the laws of the Union. And that would include taking care of our border, protecting our border, obviously. And so the frustration that I feel, Dr. Vieira shares it, is that Trump um, has probably got some pretty bad legal advice. So instead of just saying, as the commander-in-chief and as the president, I have a responsibility to enforce our immigration laws and also my you know, military authority as commander-in-chief to defend this nation, a you know, power and a duty. And you can even simply deploy the military, just like Wilson did back in 1916, when Pancho Villa and his bandits raided across the uh, Mexican border. So he has very concrete authority. I mean, all the all the left is running around screaming that he's a dictator and he's violating the Constitution, a bunch of nonsense. Mm. Um, but what he did that was wrong, or actually a bad strategy, is instead of relying on those, you know, statutes going all the way all the way back to the founding about regulations governing the military and when they can and can't be used and how, under which the president has been de delegated, you know, given, given plenty of authority by Congress as far as how to do it, but under his own authority as commander-in-chief. Instead of relying on that, which they should have done, he instead relied on a 1976 statute passed by Congress called the National Emergencies Act. And the reason they passed that statute is you had presidents running around declaring emergencies for stuff like, you know, like uh like Truman seizing the steel mills during during the Korean War. And they weren't really in other things that were done by presidents uh, since FDR, uh, declaring you know, economic emergencies, all kinds of emergencies. Uh, there's, one, there's even one emergency over measles. So, you know, presidents were stepping outside of their role as the commander-in-chief of the military and had been declaring these emergencies and trying to act, you know, almost like trying to bring over their emergency powers of the commander-in-chief into, into the domestic sphere. And so Congress wanted to trim that back, and so they, they passed this act in 1976, but it gives Congress the authority to override a president's declaration of emergency. And that's the problem with relying on that. So now he's been set up. I think he, you know, he's been literally set up in this almost no-win situation where he now has claimed authority to do what he's doing, try to build the wall under the 1976 statute which allows Congress to go back in and second-guess and override his decision. If they get a, I think I believe it's a narrow majority in, in both the House and the Senate can override his declaration. 
So it's a very bad move uh, legally uh, for, for the president to use that. And But he can still fix it, as we discussed on the show, with, on Alex Jones' show, with Dr. Vieira. He can, he can simply rescind this order and issue a new one, deploying the military, calling up the military to go to the border and defend the country. And he could use all of DOD resources at his disposal to, to build the barriers the military would use to do that. And that's, that's his strongest position. And that's what we think he should do. He should just go back to his concrete authority as commander-in-chief. And so it's baffling about the way they did it. He's getting terrible advice, and whether it's – I can't believe it's just pure ignorance. It must be intentional because, you know, we just came off of the Bush administration and post-9-11 – doing almost everything it can think of under his authority as commander-in-chief, you know, waging war all over the world and claiming all kinds of powers. And then you had Obama doing much the same, also a wartime president. So it's bizarre to see Trump completely ignoring his powers as commander-in-chief instead, relying on a very narrow um, interpretation of his ability to move discretionary funds around under the National Emergencies Act. So I think it's just a very, very bad strategy. Hmm. So I, I imagine you expect con- Congress will intervene. Um, it, I mean, at what point? This has uh, already gone way beyond what I thought uh, this nation uh, was capable of tolerating uh, in, in just sitting around and watching. I mean, we have really slid a long way here. Uh, it, we're looking at what can really only be described as an invasion here. As I, I was talking earlier, as I'm trying to correct my own language, uh, and, and I'm not calling uh, this flood that's coming right now from the South illegal immigrants, as they've already stated their intent is not to immigrate uh, and, and take part in that process. So, I mean, this is an invasion. Uh, I, I think we most of your common sense people can agree to that, but the extreme left uh, really try to play them off as refugees. Is there any evidence at all? that could possibly be offered from that side that would indicate these are refugees? Well, some might be. Some might actually have a legitimate asylum claim and be afraid of their own safety at the hands of their own government, like someplace like El Salvador, for example, or Guatemala. <clears throat> but how would you know? I mean, the, the, the vast majority of them, they've been, they've been asked in, in interviews, you know, why are you coming? It's simply economic. They want a better life, which, which is, of course, you know, everyone understands that, right? But you got to do it legally. So but, most of them are not legitimate asylum claims. Right, but, uh, it, but the problem, but the problem is, is there's, there's no detention space for. I mean, Border Patrol is running out of detention space. I was just down in Eagle Pass yesterday, talking to Border Patrol agents and also DPS agents who are out there, you know, Texas DPS. And the problem is, is they're they they are overwhelmed, and they get overwhelmed. They run out of detention space, and then the, the next thing that they're told that by the supervisor they must do is simply you know, process them for asylum claim, give them a court date, and then turn them loose. And that's the problem. Mm-hmm. Now, there is a way to fix that. So the, 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 the absurd interpretation of the courts of the asylum system is at the root of the problem right now, right? Because Trump, the initial executive order is saying, hey, you want, you want to apply for asylum? You have to do it at a port of entry. You can't just cross the border between the ports of entry or we're not going to recognize that as a legitimate asylum claim. Yeah. So when the court said, no, you can't do it, you can't do that, you have to let them claim asylum even if they set foot illegally in between the ports. Now, That's the root of the problem. I mean, isn't it part of the uh, international law in this situation where if they are, in fact, uh, seeking asylum, if they are refugees technically seeking asylum, that the moment they uh, cross out of their own border that they can apply for that in the first uh, n- neighboring nation, any of the nations, and I understand... Yeah, they, could, they could apply it in any of the consulates in Mexico, for example. Mexico has already given them asylum and said you can stay here. So, it, so it's not necessary by any means. But what the court said, this is these are leftist judges. What the leftist judges have done is they've done the Democratic Party a massive favor and told the president he can't stop this massive flow of people stepping foot onto U.S. soil once they set foot on the U.S. soil, they must be processed for asylum. Uh-huh. But he does have a remedy right now he's not using. I'm really surprised he's not using. You know what that is? What's that? He could put them on a military base and detain them for the duration of their, of their uh-huh. claim until they get a yeah. judge in there to see them and 
and process their asylum claims. Yeah. He doesn't have to turn them loose. So I don't understand. This is, this is something that Bush did. The Bush administration in 2000, I think it was 2003 or four, and then Obama did something similar. You can house them on military bases inside the U.S., for example, and say, you know, you want, to, you want to be on U.S. soil? Great. You can be on this military base. Or you can stay in Mexico. It's up to you. What do you want to do? Mm. Go back to Mexico, which has given you asylum, or you can stay on the base. And that gives him the out around this ridiculous, absurd um, leftist judge ruling that leaves the gates open. He can say, hey, according to the courts, I have to process you. Well, great. You can sit on the military base until a judge can hear, hear your claim. And if you're legitimate, then great. You get asylum. If you're not, you're going back across the board. Mm. I don't know why Trump doesn't do that. Well, um, well, I imagine this was one of the things that uh, Dr. Vieira probably had a, a pretty firm opinion on, if I know him. Um, now, and we yeah. discussed that actually, but but it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious. If, if a person is not a U.S. citizen, but the court's given them a, a you know the right to an asylum claim, well, great. Hmm. They don't have to be let loose on, on U.S. soil. They could be detained. Yeah. Or they can be given the option to go back to Mexico and wait there. Yeah. That's something that Trump could do right now. So he's got no excuse for not doing that. Yeah. Don't let him off the hook. Now, how confident are you in the president's advisors? Not at all. I mean, look, we just we just had the cave um, pull the whistle on or, or leak or you know spill the beans on a 25th Amendment coup that they were plotting to do two years ago, mm. including his, you know, the, the deputy attorney general. Yeah. So, whatever cabal of, of, of never Trumpers or, or deep state people that were involved in that, I would say some of them were obviously still on, on the staff. Yeah. Now, and this is among the things that I, I think. Um, yeah, I know I consider it, anyways. Is that as the president tries to untangle this mess? And that's probably one of the best ways to describe it. It's just a network of entanglements that we've gotten ourselves into, uh, the bureaucratic network uh, mixed with the yeah, government. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, we, used to, we used to call it a shadow government. The new, the new term for the same thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, you know, taking this apart is going to take some time. And, uh, you know, I believe that uh, the speed in which, because I get in these debates with people literally almost every day, is they uh, they are convinced he's a complete phony, um, or he'd do this, he'd do that, he'd do the other. He'd just come out and you know beat on the biggest uh, gorilla in the room, a Federal Reserve and what what have you. And you know I, I think you have to have uh, some integrity, some semblance of integrity in uh, both the uh, intelligence agencies. You know, because you, if your intelligence agency is um, corrupt. You know they're going to create the intelligence that they need to uh, crucify you, um, in in the judicial, and I see uh, slow progress, uh, but progress nonetheless being made in both of those arenas. Do you think there's an underlying strategy uh, where he may very well um, be aware of and thinking, or or at least considering some of these options? But given I don't know. I mean, if, if he if he had been he has control over his own cabinet. He has oh. control over his own pick for, a, for attorney general, for example. Mm. And he just, you know, pushed through Barr, who is an old, you know, Bush senior attorney general and is in, openly in favor of red flag laws, for example, the national red flag law, which is mm. absolutely kryptonite for, for gun rights. It's horrible. Yeah. So yep. I don't have a lot of confidence in, in, in Barr, frankly. I just don't. And then people are like, oh, you know, you shouldn't say that. And you got to give the president a chance. Maybe he's got a reason for putting Barr in there. I don't think so. I, I think he's been given horrible advice. I don't think he understands fully exactly who these people are. And I don't know what's going on in his inner circle. It could be Kushner. I just don't know. Hmm. But um, I suspect it's Kushner. But he's getting awful advice about who he should be putting in office. He's, he's probably being told, "We well, need a seasoned, experienced attorney general who will be respected." Mm. That's why you got to put Barr in there. And to me, Barr is just another swamp creature. Yeah, I mean, that's what he's done his entire life. So yeah. you know, someone like Edwin Vieira should be the attorney general. 
Yes. <laughs> or, or someone like Judge Napolitano. Pick somebody who's who's proven by their own personal, you know, ethics and their own their own commitment in their careers to, to the Constitution. That's what he needs. He really needs that, and he hasn't done it yet. So yeah. He's you know so that the very the most charitable to him. He has been outmaneuvered and given horrible advice. He continues to accept. Oh uh, yeah, he appointed uh, uh, Vince DeVito from Massachusetts, a big Agenda Twenty One advocate, um, uh, just a typical bottom feeding uh, lawyer out here for the Mass GOP. He was their gen- general counsel for the Mass GOP for a while, and uh, Trump wound up appointing him to the Department of the Interior. So there's another one that yeah, got so away. There, there you go. So he's totally, you know, he, he said, he said it's supposed to be great in the swamp, right? Well, all he's doing is, is re, <laughs> he's, he's, he's feeding the swamp creatures. No. So I'm going to, I'm going to guess that he has gotten bad advice. I think he might have good intent, but I mean, it's, it's demonstrably, demonstrably bad advice. This, you know, as everyone here pointed out very capably, relying on the National Emergencies Act was a huge mistake. It, it's, it's like McConnell, apparently McConnell tricked him into signing that budget bill saying, well, if you sign this budget bill, we'll go ahead and, and we'll give you some wall funding mm. if your campaign promise. Well, now McConnell's going to go align with the Democrats, most likely. I think the Republicans in the Senate will go right along with the Democrats mm. and strike down his declaration of emergency. Yeah. Yeah. It's my, I'll, I'll bet you $1,000 that they do. It, they are making them uh, noises already. Uh, absolutely. So uh, I can't imagine uh, he's the type not to already have uh, a plan B and C in place. Well, he's, he's a smart businessman, but he's not a he's not a constitutionalist. He's not a constitutional scholar. No, no, and he no. He apparently doesn't have honest uh, legal counsel who's who's advising him on what he actually can do. Because I haven't seen him yet. He talks about deploying the military, but it's always in the context of you know, support roles and, and things like that. What he should have done, he should have declared the. Mexican cartel to be international terrorist organizations, which he can do under his authority as commander in chief. Mm-hmm. He should have said they are military, you know, unconventional warfare opponents, which they are, just like Pancho Villa was. Mm-hmm. Pancho Villa back in the day controlled northern northern Mexico and then raided across the border into the United States. The cartels today control northern Mexico and they also come across the border of the United States and kill Americans, you know, mm-hmm. basically raid. But they stay here too. They've infiltrated. All along our border, many of the border towns and counties are basically run by the cartels. Everyone's in their back pocket. So it's it's as bad or worse than what Pancho Villa did. So mm. the president can, can take care of this with the military. That's, yeah. what, that's what he should do. So but why he hasn't done that, I think it's just bad legal advice. And it's probably intentional. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the things that... Um, I'm not going to say attracted me to him because I, I've never, you know, I, he he gets my support conditionally, um, but he was never uh, an affiliate of the Council on Foreign Relations. That's kind of my personal litmus test. Is you oh, know, sure. it's, all kind of good. I mean, it, it's great to have someone who's an outsider, mm. who's not in, the, in those clubs, and who's not a, a prior politician. Don't get me wrong. But his appointees but are. If you're going to do that, go find yourself some squared away legal counsel mm. like going in. You should be looking for who is the most staunch constitutionalist firebrand lawyer in the country. Yeah. That's what you should have been looking for. Yeah. You know, and frankly, I would have put it, I would have put Evan Vieira in there. Yeah. Because he's, he's, he's extremely knowledgeable and he's, he's unimpeachable as far as his character goes. Yeah. What do you think of Trey Gowdy? He sometimes uh, comes out of nowhere with uh, a little common sense. I don't know. I don't know enough about him. I, I just I just know what I would have done. You, this is for all the marbles. Yeah. If you're going to go in there to actually drain the swamp, and then I would be looking for, like I said, looking for the guys that are that have demonstrated throughout their entire career their, their devotion. Yeah. Huh. So. Um. Wow. So. So we're going to do our best. I asked Dr. Vera to write up his recommendation for the president, for what he should do to, to fix this, to, to make himself you know, to put himself in a better position, and do this right. And we're going to do our best to get to him. Yeah. That's our plan. All right. Well, it, it sounds uh, uh, very um, reasonable for one thing. And I hope, uh, you know, we're going to see things get more polarized in this. Do you, do you expect, uh, you know, that they're going to just stop with trying to uh, vote this down 
Uh, do you, or do you think this is going to be used as a stepping stone and momentum? I mean, there's always been rumblings of impeachment, this, that, and the other. And well, I think, I think there's an attempt to impeach him. And I also think um, the 25th Amendment is still on the table. In fact, you, I think I heard uh, uh, Warren talking about the other day that, that they would still consider. Now, that's an open coup, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, and that might be why McCabe came out with his book. It might be just part of their plan to make this, you know, bring it out in the open, start talking about it openly. Yeah, yeah. Using the 25th Amendment. So, you know, that works, right? They would have to convince the majority of his cabinet and the vice president to go along with it. Yeah. Um, they, it, could, they could temporarily remove the president and the vice president become the president. And then, oh. uh, then, it, goes to the, then it goes to Congress to, to, to make it official. Okay. And he, the president could appeal it. He could... We could challenge it if it goes to Congress. Yeah. So that's the mechanism they might try to use. Of course, he would have an out, I think, in the courts to say this is not a legitimate use of the 25th Amendment. So we should do is so immediately go to the Supreme Court. And that's the other thing that's just driving Dr. Pierre and I nuts is in Trump's own uh, Rose Garden you know, press conference about his emergency declaration, he says, oh, I know they're going to challenge me. It's going to go to some district court judge in the Ninth Circuit. It's going to rule against me. And then it's going to go to the appellate court. Then it's going to go to the Supreme Court. You know, it might take eight months, but that will, you know, how long it'll take, but we'll eventually win, he said. Yeah. And that's just not accurate. He doesn't have to wait until, you know, some district court judge rules and then it goes to the appellate court, to the Supreme Court. He can go straight to the Supreme Court right now and ask the Supreme Court to, to find, to, you know, as soon as, as soon as there's a, um, a ruling against him down in district court, he can go straight to the Supreme Court and say, hey, you know, Supreme Court step in, don't let this judge uh, interrupt my ability to do my job. Yeah. The Supreme Court can do that. Huh. Wow. Boy, this could uh, get very complex and uh, hairy at, at the worst time ever. It, you know, it, you think about it, this is all, you know, everything that we've been talking about is just the uh, legal and, and lawful, the constitutional aspect of it. It, and, you know, we got to understand as we are dealing with this and as we will in, in the days to come, it, you know, thousands and thousands of people with uh, kind of ill intent are marching right towards our border. Uh, you know, oof, what do we do? Those caravans. those caravans are just the, the, latest, the latest example of what's been going. I mean, there's been a daily, for decades, a daily incursion. So we have like what, 30 million, that's estimated 30 million illegal aliens in the United States already. Yeah. So, I mean, the caravans are a serious issue, but, but really the day-to-day the -day grind of, of the cartels bringing people over, you know, every day for, for decades. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is a precedent-setting surge on our borders. If they're allowed to get away with this, you know, what, what's the message that uh, the United States is now sending uh, to anyone who wants to go into South America and walk right across our borders. You know, they're, they're, open. They can, yeah, we'll stand anyone down. An OTM. Anyone is an OTM. Um, only the Mexican nationals are being turned back into Mexico. If they're other than Mexican, OTM, they're processed for asylum. And then all they got to do is fill the, the holding facilities, which they have, and then they let loose to give them a bus ticket. So... Like I said, Trump Trump can stop that right now. The immediate first fix he must do is is one, deploy the military, two, take a few of our military bases and use them as detention facilities yeah. for these people. And you know, the left of course will claim this be the concentration camps, et cetera. Hey, that's why you make it very obvious and overt that if you don't want to be in on a military base, but you know, military families have no problem with on a military base, they don't consider it oppressive. But, hey, if you don't want to live on a military base inside the United States while you wait for your son, claim to be processed, you and your family, then go back to Mexico. You're free to go. Yeah. You're being held here against your will. Yeah. You, know? you can't go into the United States, but you can go onto the base. Like yeah. right here in San Antonio, where I'm at right now, there's, there's, uh, there's I believe it's Kelly Air Force Base, and there's, there's also a lot. There's right. kind of different Air Force bases they could use. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> you know, if you spent some uh, time down there. You were broadcasting out of uh, Texas, right? So... I'm I mean, still in Texas. Are, right. are you? We have, a, we have an event on the border on March 2nd, next Saturday. It's a combined um, rally in support of the wall and also a vigil on the border to do our part to try to interrupt the, uh, the flow coming across. Oh, excellent. We'll be out there at night on, on watch during daylight 
will be would be all the speakers, and it will be basically a rally in support of the president's uh, position, and also in support of a Texas bill. There's a Texas uh, legislator, his name is Kyle Biederman, who has proposed a bill in the Texas legislature for Texas to use its own money to build its own wall, so a Texas wall, which I think is a brilliant, brilliant idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and Texas has a very large rainy day fund that has plenty of money in it, and he's proposed a $2.5 billion of that, of that rainy day fund or other state funds be used. He's still trying to figure out how to get the money together. But I think it's a great idea. Uh uh-huh. You know, and we're getting a little bit now uh, in a direction I wanted to touch on to a little bit is uh, the states, these border states. Is there any, uh, uh, you know, intestinal political integrity uh, in states' rights in, in the states actually taking a stand if the federal government cannot unscrew itself quick enough to uh, react to the situation? Do you, do you think there's well, there a... Is- the political will and are the uh, the militias, the National Guard, uh, are uh, are they ready and willing? Well, it goes down to the governor. The governor of each state is the commander in chief, and once they're called in the federal service, he's the commander in chief of the state uh, armed forces, which would be the militia. Uh, and of course, since we don't really have a little militia anymore, the state National Guard. So, Governor like Governor Abbott, for example. Um, he has deployed Texas DPS, which is their higher patrol. He has deployed them down the border. Um, problem with that, they've already spent, I believe they've spent $6 billion so far in the last eight years um, deploying DPS, Texas DPS, down the border. That's one of one of Representative Calbina's points, is they've already spent $6 billion of Texas money to go down and, and try to help the national uh, the Border Patrol on the border in Texas. They could have built a wall two or three times over by, by now with that, with that kind of money. Mm. So it's frustrating for, for him and other, other Texas legislators to look at that and go, why are we why do we keep doing this? We send DPS down there. And the latest permutation of this, I, I went and talked to some DPS officers. All they're really doing is standing there, and then when someone comes across, they, they just call Border Patrol. So they're a visual deterrent, which might deter some, but most of the ones who are coming across want to get caught because they want to be processed for asylum. Mm. So rather than that's kind of like money down a rabbit hole, you're going to keep spending that money all the time. Why not instead uh, put together your own barrier system of, of fences and roads and sensors, et cetera, and then manpower in Texas to take care of the job. So that's what I think should be done. Mm. So now whether or not it will actually happen, that's why we're, that's what we're pushing for this next weekend. Part of our reason for being there is to uh, raise, a, raise awareness among Texans. This is what we need to do and to push their governor, I think Governor Abbott of Texas should declare his own emergency as the governor of Texas. Um, say, look, there is an emergency on the border. I think the president is correct. It would, it would help the president, I think, immensely, um, both in the courts but also in the court of public opinion, if Abbott were to step up. Or like Doug Ducey in Arizona, who's also uh, supposedly a Republican, but he, he so, so far he's been, he's been mute and kind of silent mm. on, on these issues. So I think these, these, these border... At least in Arizona and Texas, where you have two Republicans, I don't understand why they're not stepping up and backing the president. Like by by declaring emergency in their state too. Yeah, yeah. Now, the National Guard and border. Are you noticing um, any correlation in the amount? I see some articles uh, coming out, and with the press being what it is, I don't know if this is a, a legitimate bump in news or if there are things that are just all of a sudden uh, becoming uh, available. But we're seeing stories of uh, relatively large uh, batches of both uh, drugs and weapons, things like that, that are being seized at the border um, many times through tunnel networks and whatnot. So as they're going through, obviously they're doing more than accounting for a fence above ground, and they're dealing with uh, the border and the threat at that borderline as a whole. But are, are, do you see a correlation, any notable, legitimate uptick in the amount of drugs and things like that that are being seized as a result of the, the wall that's being built and uh, the pressure on the border? Well, we've, we've had some pretty large um, drug seizures that have been in the news, but, but I think it's because everyone's watching the border. I don't, I don't really know. I didn't ask the uh, border patrol 
about whether they've had I mean, an uptick in, in seizures or an uptick in, in, in the blood <coughs> based traffic. Yeah, I mean, sure. yeah, I'm wondering if there's, uh, because of the pressure and the attention here, if there's been any notable uptick uh, in, you know, its effectiveness. It has, is this attention? Is well, the, there's, the, been, there's been reinforcement at the ports of entry. Most, most of the, the military and National Guard that came in were reinforcing at or near the ports of entry, like, like down in San Isidro and in, in, uh, down in San Diego. But also, you know, we saw a, a buildup in, in, in uh, El Paso, a build up in Eagle Pass, you know, build up. There, there was some there was some National Guard units there just yesterday when we were there too. Uh-huh. So most of it's near the ports of entry. Not a lot of it in between. I mean, there's vast, huge, empty areas in between. And that's, that was kind of the point of um, Jim Chilton from Chilton's Ranch in Arizona uh, talking to the president, showing him footage of, of the, you know, for many decades there have been there have been cameras out on his ranch yeah. um, videotaping these drug mules coming across backpacks full of drugs. And, and also bringing people over. A guy with camouflage and, and with rifles coming across in the United States over and over and over. Yeah. That's still going on. Yeah. That hasn't stopped. And that's what's bizarre about the, the left saying the, the caravan in some ways that have helped the left because they can say, you know, this this is all about the caravan. And everyone's looking at these caravans and then of course they parade women and children up front and say, that's all this is, or it's a humanitarian crisis. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a real emergency. But the real emergency has been long before these caravans popped up the day-to-day incursions by the cartels, you know, of thousands of people coming across the border, a lot of them with drugs, other ones being sex slaves, women and children, mm-hmm. sold into sex slavery inside the U.S. Yep. But then who, who knows who else they're bringing across? Who knows? We don't know. Yeah, I, uh, there, there's an entire uh, network of, of evils that come along with this. And I've often, uh, you know, I don't usually limit my discussion on this, you know, to poor us, poor Americans. You know, I, I actually remind them, you know, that the women and children here that are uh, doing this, you know, they're under the radar. No one knows, you know, technically that, that they're there. Anything could happen on the Mexican side of the border on ours in the well, process. It, yeah. They're, they're, they're abducted. They're raped. They're beaten. They're forced into sex slavery by the cartels yeah. in Mexico. And then they're brought across the border forced into more sex slavery in the U.S. Well, that's some, what happens to them. Sometimes they take the coyotes, take their money, and then drive them uh, in a truck out in the desert and, and leave them out there to, to cook and die. Uh, I mean, all kinds yeah. of horrible things happen. Yeah. So well, there's, there's abandonment in the desert. A lot of times they won't make it. They'll yeah. They'll die out in the desert. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of bad things that happen all the way around uh, yeah. to, to them and us. Like the cartels, you know, there's all the... The headings going on right there across the road, you know, across the border of Juarez. Yeah. All of that, like right across from El Paso. It, it's, it's horrible. And, you know, they're they're like ISIS. They terrorize the Mexican people. If you dare cross them, they'll cut your head off. They abduct people and demand ransom. If the family doesn't pay, they cut their head off. Um, if they, they demand money, protection money from business owners, and they can't pay, they take their daughters into sex slavery and force them into prostitution. That's what they do. They're horrible. And Mexico does not control its own territory. The Mexican government does not have any real control over its own territory. It, it, so it, they're very much like the Taliban. They're taking over northern Mexico. The cartels yeah. are like the Taliban or like ISIS. Yeah. So, I mean, is it fair to say that the um, Mexican government uh, is going to kind of have to play some role in, in this? or what? It, I, it, well, yeah, but they failed. It's a failed state. Like, like yeah. Vieira has correctly called it, it's a failed narco state. So we just we just found out in the El Chapo trial that he bribed the last president of Mexico a hundred million dollars. So he owned him. It was you know what they call plato or plomo, yeah. either silver or lead. That's that's the offer. Mm. You either take the the, Mex- the uh, cartel's money and they own you, or if you resist them, then you get the lead. That's yeah. the that's the dysfunction and, and failure, the collapsed state failure of Mexico. Yeah. Wow. So, so what do you think uh, Trump's role or the administration's role in dealing with the uh, government of Mexico? Is there? Uh... Well, I, frankly, I think he should do what Wilson did he, for the same reasons. He should say, Mexico, I'm going to give you X amount of days to, to to seal your border with you know your southern border and squirrel and stop the flow of these caravans. And B, I expect you to go and deploy your military and clean house on the cartels. And if you don't do it in X number of days, I'm going to do it. 
mm-hmm. and then do it what Wilson did. Wilson sent Blackjack Pershing with a punitive expedition of U.S. Army soldiers and National Guard into Mexico to go after Pancho Villa. They didn't catch him, but they, but they crossed over the border to, to take it to him, to defeat him militarily, yeah. because they had to, because he was he was a military enemy that Mexico could not control. The, the cartels are exactly the same. There's mm-hmm. no difference. Yeah. Yeah, we got some uh, numbers of MS-13 types here uh, on both sides of the border. They, you know, they're spreading uh, all over the place, and I know Trump's. Yeah, and, that, and that's only one gang. There's a whole bunch of different gangs, that yeah. are like real proxy gangs for the cartels. Yeah, yeah. I mean, agreed. There's, there's always like uh, motorcycle clubs. There's uh, many of them out there of varying sizes, many little uh, offshoots, but. You know, MS-13... Yeah, you got support clubs, right? It's, it's like that. Yeah. Exactly. It's, a, it's a good parallel. Yeah. Um, the cartels, what they, what I've found by talking to Border Patrol, local cops, local area residents, all over the border, especially in Texas, is that the cartels have... They'll use underage kids to bring the drugs across because if it's underage kids, they'll get prosecuted. This gets sent back to Mexico. And then they have, so they have gangbanger wannabe underage kids in Mexico who bring drugs across. So they pass them off to gangbanger wannabe uh, American kids mm. all along the border who want to make money. Mm. It's, a, it's a corrupting system, just like you have in the inner cities of, Me- of, the, of Chicago. You know, this, this is your way up. This is your way up and out of your poverty is to be a gangbanger, to be a stud. Mm. And so a lot of these young kids want that, want that life. Yeah. So, you know, other than decriminalizing all the drugs, which would definitely hurt the cartel's profit. Short of that, the other way to do it is to deploy the military and steal the frigging border. Yeah. And if we have to, that might include going into Mexico five, ten miles or whatever and creating your own DMZ there. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one of uh, the folks in chat mentioned uh, uh, the UN in Mexico. And going back uh, a few years here, uh, one of my resources told me that there was a relatively significant uh, number of UN troops that were on hold over uh, the border. I think it was like within 60 miles of the border into Mexico, uh, a bunch of UN troops. Um, is there any uh, evidence or, or uh, knowledge of UN troops at all being present uh, in the Mexico area where anywhere? I have not heard that, but I, I'm not really an expert on, on what's going on inside of Mexico, other than the fact that I know it's failed. Yeah. <laughs> I, know it's going, I know what's going on in northern Mexico. I mean, Leo Juarez. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you guys heard of the auto defensia groups, the, uh, what they called um, community police in right. Mexico? You know what that is? Yeah, vaguely familiar. Right. Well, that was was was, was in some of these some of these places, I think Michoacan was one of them. The local residents got sick and tired of being terrorized by the cartels, mm. and they raised up against them. And, and, and what happened was, the, the, the spark was when they came for protection money and, and the business owners could pay, they took their daughters. Mm. And that just pissed off the local residents. It was kind of like a approach too far for them. Yeah. And so it started out in a rebellion among the ranchers. It was actually the ranchers, like ranchers' council, that the cartel was trying to take over, the landowners' council. And the local ranchers got together with some business owners, and it was about 100, no, it was 300, 300 local men armed up, went in there and kicked ass on the cartel at this rancher's hearing. And then, then they, it was basically open warfare against the cartel. Um, they arrested some of them, turned them over to the police. The police promptly let them go. And after that, they just no longer detained, no more prisoners. They just, they just killed the cartel guys. Wow. They had a cartel tattoo, they just killed them. And so they 300 men starting out, and then it grew to about 3,000, about 3,000 local residents. And there was only 100 cartel guys terrorizing this entire community. Hmm. So quick, pretty quickly, the cartel was outnumbered once the locals were organized. Wow. So they, they took it to the cartels and kicked their ass. Um, but then, of course, the Mexican government turned against them and tried to disarm it. So oh. they, I'm not sure what the status is right now, but there was a tit for chat going back and forth between the Mexican government and these, these community defense teams, yeah. which were, you know, basically militia. Yeah, so yeah. yeah and but, give you an idea of how failed a state Mexico is. Yeah, and, and the, the police are so corrupt. And the importance of our Second Amendment here, I mean, that really sta- stands as a, a perfect example 
of why uh, the, the American people should be armed. Is that, it, you know, we will would never be overrun by drug lords is there would be a breaking point. The public would well, say, unless you're not organized. I mean, they, they, they had shotguns and rifles, too, that would kill coyotes and stuff with, right? Well, um, but they weren't organized at first. No. So you got to be, that's why the founder insisted on a militia. A militia is an organized body of men. Yeah. Just individual gun owners. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Um, I, I often uh, say that it's not a matter of, uh, if uh, there's a militia, uh, is whether you're delinquent in your trainings or not. <laughs> there is, is, well, is yeah, deemed well, to be necessary. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to wind up, it's what we said about hurricanes, you know, you're going to wind up on your front lawn um, mixed with your neighbors with a, with, a, with a shotgun and a rifle in your hand, stopping the looters. It's going to happen. Mm. So, you know, why not, why not organize in advance? That's what I would prefer to see happen. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the red uh, laws uh, earlier, and we've had some incidents. Uh, they, they just seem to happen every year or so. Uh, Connecticut, they, they were trying to register uh, weapons. There's these big pushes in uh, the bump stock ban that we had here in Massachusetts. Um, we're starting to see 80% and better noncompliance. People are just saying, screw you. What state uh, and, are you in? Uh, in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, <laughs> <laughs> right? You guys have a red flag law, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, we got it early on. They're they're pushing it federally now, all over the place. But we're seeing, uh, you know, like with the bump stock ban and things like that, people are ordered to turn these things in, turn in their weapons, register their weapons, and they're not doing it. We're seeing. Uh, I'm seeking 100 percent. Non-compliance with these unconstitutional diktats, but uh, right now the right, population. So the, the problem with the red flag bills is, is it's not it, it's it's not dependent on you. I mean, you're not complying is is not really a remedy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it's going to come down to whether it's your turn to be raided that night. It's one gun owner at a time. Mm. You know, so that's the problem. What's what's your red flag bill say in your state? Yeah, you're I know. Can, it can. Uh, it's got to be a family member, and uh, I think law enforcement uh, are able. Uh, they uh, automatic uh, warrant, is, and you they go right in and take it. There's people dying in other states. It didn't take long yeah, for these red flag bills to pass before people started dying, and they were folks that were just some of them uh, just saying, "No, I'm not giving up my arms," so they got killed. Right. That's the problem. It's just for those who don't know, I mean. They're, they vary by state, but the, the crux of the red flag bill is, I mean, Gun of America calls them gun confiscation bills, which is exactly right. Because what they allow is what they call an ex parte hearing. What that means is that you're not present. Yeah. You won't even know it's happening. You know, some states it's, it's a family member or law enforcement. Other states it's, it's wide open almost anybody. But like that guy that died in Maryland, it was his own sister. He got in an argument with his, with his adult sister. She called the cops on him and then started the process that went before a judge without him even knowing about it. So this is ex parte. You don't know about it. You don't, you don't have an opportunity to confront your accusers or present witnesses on your behalf yeah. or evidence on your behalf. Nothing. And it's in front of some judge. It's not a jury trial. So And then the judge says, yeah, it's, and, and also the burden a lot of times is you know, preponderance of evidence. Basically yeah. that, yeah. It sounds like there's credible or even just credible evidence that this person might be a threat. Might be. So it's like future crime. Yeah. So the yeah, judge yeah. Says, so, so some anti gun judge listens to some pissed off, you know, relative of an axe grind or a neighbor or an ex wife or whatever, and he says, Sure, I think this guy's a danger. I mean, of course he's anti gun in the first place. So he issues an order for the police to come to your house and, you know, quote unquote temporarily take your guns. So well, they show up. Armed cops come into your house. They think you're a danger, mm -hmm. and if you make one false move, you're dead. Yeah, that's the re that's the reality. Yeah, and they come and take your guns, and then, then you got to fight. You get your guns back once they once they've taken them. Then you got to go to court to prove you're not a danger to the community. So imagine you're looking looking at the Covington kids. You got kids in Washington D.C. on a field trip who went there for the March for Life, standing around with MAGA hats on their head to make America great again. And they're, look how demonized they were. Yeah. They were automatically labeled racist and fascist and they must be violent and they were intimidating this poor you know native american 
and it's just like you know automatic demonization, like right out of 1984. Yeah. You know, it was, it was basically face crime and hat crime. Hmm. So imagine if, if the same kind of hatred that's projected by the left towards anybody, the Trump supporter, or anybody, the gun owner, or conservative, you know, veterans, like retired cop, you name it, they hate your guts. Yeah. Imagine if they have the ability to swat you. You know, swatting is right. Yeah. Swatting is where you call and you claim the guy's got hostages or whatever, and the SWAT team shows up. That's swatting. Yeah. This is institutionalized, legalized <coughs> swatting. This allows them to target their political enemies with a SWAT team, potentially, yeah. at least a couple of cops come into your door because they don't like the politics. That's what this is. Yeah, I mean, there's a good reason why the Constitution was uh, very firm in this area in that you know, that does not uh, leave very much wiggle room in there uh, at all. It, 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 it's people are, um, you know, they're assumed uh, guilty, and, and the cops come out there. They're amped up uh, because just the whole process, you know, lends yeah. itself to that. So they show up all amped up, uh, thinking the worst. And, you know, I, and I do feel for these guys. I see as many videos out there of uh, police using excessive force as I do seeing cops walk up to a window uh, for someone with a light out and get shot in the face. So, I, I, I you know, this is uh, a case-by-case -case thing. But the government... Well, the problem is, like you said, the, the police officer just gets this order and it's saying that this person has been found by a judge to be a threat to the community. Yeah. And you need to go take his guns away. So they're going up there presupposing that, yeah, he must be some kind of threat. Yeah. You know? It, it, and they're going there to take your guns, and you don't even know it's coming. Yeah. So here you are, caught flat-footed, all of a sudden a cops are at your door, and like I said, you know, who knows what will happen. Yeah. So you better be, you know, you make one false move, and, you're, and you can be shot. Yeah, and it's a system built to be uh, abused. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, uh, restraining orders. You know, they, they really don't... It's the, it's the same... It's the same exact process, except that it's opened up. It's beyond a domestic partner. Yeah. Okay? The straining orders are abused all the time by pissed-off wives or girlfriends that want to use it as a way to get back at the guy. It happens all the time. Yeah, and okay, this what, is the same way. Right, but this is worse because it's not just, you know, someone mm -hmm. you're, you're in a relationship with, you know, living together. This is people who don't live with you. Yeah. It's like, a, like the guy in Maryland who died. It was his adult sister. She yeah. later said, oh, that was unnecessary, and they shouldn't have killed him. He wasn't really in danger. Too late. She's yeah. the one that did that. She got pissed off at her brother, but they weren't living together. It wasn't yeah. a domestic violence situation. Yeah, yeah. She just got angry at him and wanted to use, wanted to use the state to get back at him. Yeah. So in some places, it's not just family. It's a local politician can do it, or the police. What if, what if you are the gadfly who's always down the town council complaining about whatever they're doing, and the local police chief decides he thinks you're a fear of threat. Yeah. He can go to the judge without even knowing about it and get you get you disarmed. So what's going to happen is they will use it as political weapons against their political opponents, the left will. And what will also happen is conservatives will be chilled in their speech. They'll be afraid to stand, yeah. stand up and say anything because they'll be afraid of being swatted. Sure. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I definitely see where that could be uh, used as a, a throttle uh, to influence civic engagement, for sure. Um, Which is why every gun owner needs to dig in their heels and demand that their elected representative at every level does not vote for a red flag bill. I don't care where it is, state or federal. Yeah. I don't care if it's President Trump. He needs the same message. Don't do it. Yeah, if, if he does it, it'll, it'll, if it's at the national level, it'll be it'll be like kryptonite to your gun rights. It'll be gun confiscation. You know, all those gun owners have said for, for so long, you know, we're three percenters, we're never going to back up. If you try to confiscate our guns, it's on, right? Mm -hmm. That's the mindset of a hardcore gun owner, which I think is right. Yeah. But this is this is the same thing. What's the difference if they don't come house to house for the whole neighborhood and so they come to your house tonight? And tomorrow they come to my house. And the next night... It's another sure. conservative sense. Yeah, but what's the difference? I expect it will be incrementalism like that. I think they will uh, boil the frog well, kind of slow to get. It's, it's for all the marbles for you. Uh, yeah. Your house. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, they'll get most of uh, those of us that are the most assertive. I think they will try to get those uh, first. The rest will just fall in line like lemmings. That's kind of the pattern out yeah, there. They'll, they'll be, they'll be, I mean, hey, man, I got guys that I know that I've met when I've been down on the border who are afraid to speak up right now about what's going on on the border because they're afraid the cartels will target their families. So it's the same kind of fear that will be systematic and institutionalized throughout leftist-controlled areas of the country in particular, because they'll be afraid to speak up because they know that if they if they make too much noise, they'll be targeted by some leftist judge, yeah. some leftist local activists, and they'll send a SWAT team. So mm-hmm. two things have got to happen. One, gun owners got to say no. If you vote for a red flag bill, you're done. Politically, you're done. Yeah. You, gotta, you just don't care who it is. You got to make that very clear. And the other thing's got to happen is we need to be proactive, reaching out to our police, letting them know that you can't enforce this stuff. This yeah. is what it means when you say you're going to refuse unlawful orders. This is what that means. This is an unlawful order. Well, it must be music to your ears to hear about those sheriffs that are uh, giving the finger, saying they're not going to enforce this stuff. In, oh, in, in uh, Washington State, for example. Yes, indeed. Absolutely right. You know, and I just, in fact, I just talked to Joey Gibson the other day. He's done a great job in Washington State. Um, I'm being proactive about that, going to state, can- or, or, now town councils and also sheriffs and, and, and uh, encouraging them to say no. So that's exactly the right thing. And the same thing goes in your state, too. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. Yeah, well, boy, you know, we're wallowing in it out here, Stuart. I, I'm telling you, um, I, I, I'm one of those that have decided that, yeah, I got a lot of really good friends that took off, many of them to the Carolinas and other parts. But, you know, I'm digging in my heels here. I was born and raised in this area. And I believe there will eventually be no place to uh, run to. I mean, all the states are, are slowly being overwhelmed with this wet blanket. Uh, but here in Massachusetts, they have torn us apart. Uh, we got a nearly monotypic legislature um, our counties have uh, been disassembled, and they're there. The county lines are technically there. We technically have a county sheriff, but they've moved the sheriff underneath the purview of the governor. So right. yeah, it, it's an absolute mess. We've uh, given up everything to regional planners who are, are just coming down on us. And things like uh, firearms, um, they're a social injustice. There's a lot of social justice warriors out here, and that's why I'm really wanted to. You know, I'm glad we got to talk about this issue with uh, the illegals coming into this country, because we are um, what the rest of the country should be looking at. Here in Massachusetts, we have got sanctuary cities all around us where these strongholds are beginning to uh, take place. They're putting down a poison tap root current legislation to give illegals a license and face it you know as well as i do folks once you have, how many times have you been asked for your license to sign up for something you can get all, you know, almost anything with that driver's license including including voting, including right. voting. yep that's right. exactly that's right this is to bring it back around full circle this is why the board is so important um they this is the ankle is correct this is their political end game for the left in this country is that's why it's becoming more openly socialist and more openly, you know, the whole infanticide bill in New York. They're just kind of, you know, taking the mask off, showing what they really are all about. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I believe they're so confident is they believe that, that if they flood us with enough people that they believe will vote Democrat, will have a permanent lock on political power. Mm-hmm. And that's what they're going for. And that's what, that's what these sanctuary, this is what baffles me also. Why is there not even one grand jury indictment yet for the sanctuary cities or the sanctuary state of California, for example? Why have, have why has the Trump administration not indicted anybody? Mm. Not even one that I know of among all those people who are coming to know the federal law right now. I don't understand it. And people say, well, you know, he's, he's a lot to do and, and, you know, there's a lot going on. If he doesn't show stims- or attack a skin on the on the wall, make one person an example by convicting somebody. Mm. He is going to get more of the same, and that's what you're seeing, right? Yeah. So you so you've got sanctuary cities down in Massachusetts, right? Oh yeah, yeah we do. And where they're, they're going to vote. And so 
So oh yeah. It's it like an ink blot. It's like it's like it's like total warfare ink blot theory. As they take over politically, and then they, they have more sanctuary cities, and they reinforce their their, their hold on power with unlawful voters, and yep. voters. Then they then they can but they can ship more of them. They can then send a bunch of them to another county, for example, and then take over that county and the other county or, or town. Yeah. Before you know it, they've got a permanent lock on the local system in this country. Yeah, and, and these yeah. are the same exact people that are trying to get rid of the Electoral College because they know darn well, and this is something I've been preaching pretty darn hard about the last uh, recent weeks, is that as this flood comes in uh, here in Massachusetts to our sanctuary cities, as illegals come in here, they take the census, all right? They, they divert funds when they say, oh, my goodness, Look at all of the people, the population swell in this particular district, which is obviously already progressively leaning because you've got a sanctuary city, and more money comes in, enormous money comes in. We may lose uh, districts because there's still a mass exodus out of Massachusetts, but as these illegals come in, they gain power in a foothold, a poison yeah, taproot. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so weird. It's like the walkway movement, I think, is a really good... I love the Walkway movement. It's great to see a lot of people inside the Democrat Party you know, realizing what's, what's, what's becoming. Yeah. Which is openly socialist, and they're walking away. Yeah. You know, and like, like I stressed last week, I went to the El Paso rally for President Trump, and about a quarter of the audience were Hispanic Americans, you know, yeah. patriots in Texas. Yeah. Nice. So there's so so they're losing. There is there is this exodus out of the Democrat Party of black and Hispanic American patriots. It's real. Yeah. Problem is, they're being replaced with unlawful voters from the third world. Right. That's the problem. Yeah, and uh, they're bringing them in faster than we can convert them. Uh, but, you know, right. I, I'd be honest with That's you, I, I find a lot of uh, uh, the Hispanic communities around here, for example, are a pretty conservative uh, group of folks. And, you know, I think given the opportunity... And many of them, they're very productive. I've seen them do great things in struggling neighborhoods before. But, man, are they uh, propagandized? And uh, and this is also, uh, a, you know, significant number of them don't vote. So those that rig elections know that. And that's part of, uh, you know, the voters that are used that wind up casting a vote that never left their home. But yeah, it's the same thing that happens in the black communities too. Yeah. And so there is that, and this is why we can't give up that ground. We can't just say, oh, yeah, the Hispanic communities are all going to vote Democrat. How can you do about it? That's, that's a mistake. Yeah, that's but not true. Like, like this next this next weekend, the chairman of Maverick County, this is where Eagle Pass is, the GOP chairman of that county is an 18 year old Hispanic kid. He needs to be one of our one of our head headline speakers at this rally we're doing. So that's the way to fight back. You go and recruit nice. young conservatives inside Hispanic and black communities, and you put them in leadership positions inside, right. inside the Republican Party, because it's difficult. Now, to the left's only, really, only real attack is that, oh, you're all racist, and that's their smear. But if you have a young Hispanic or black uh, patriot standing up in those communities, it puts a lie to that nonsense. It makes it much easier for you to convert them over. And right. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be a partisan Republican, but the Democratic Party has become openly socialist. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I I got to call out Republicans also when they make, make mistakes where they violate the Constitution. But we just we can't deny it any longer with, with, with the Democratic Party becoming. Doesn't mean every Democrat's that way. But yeah, the party, they're they're not hesitating to come out and uh and and, and bring out their socialist leanings and links. The DSA, uh, you know, the, this organization uh, last week. Just for the heck of it, I went out to, to look and see what kind of activity these socialists, technically, what presence did they have here inside of Massachusetts. And I didn't have much of a problem finding almost a half dozen uh, groups and subgroups all over the state active in talking uh, about uh, promoting and endorsing these candidates and, and the candidates openly working with them. Uh, so this whole... Uh, transition we were never we you know the, the supremacy clause is very clear uh, we are not to have anything but a republican form of government and when things like this green new deal which when you look at it and you you ask yourself the most fundamental question in this plan who controls the means of production 
you are left with no other answer but to say government. And when you look up right. what the definition of government controlling the means of production is, you have communism. You know, that's, what really, that's what this really is. Yeah, they call it something different. Yeah, Cortez is, is a communist, and so is Bernie. I mean, I mean like like Mike, Mike Vanderbilt said, you know, the founder of the Peter Sand movement, yep. the late Mike Vanderbilt, he said the only difference between a socialist and a communist is a socialist has not founded AK yet. And that's true. When it comes right down to it, there's no difference. I mean, socialism is Mar it's, it's Marxism. Yeah. That's all it is. Socialism is a step towards the ultimate goal of one-party communist rule. And look at the behavior of the left. I mean, the assault on this, uh, you know, the Turning Points USA guy, who was actually, I believe he was from the Leadership Institute on um, UC Berkeley. You know, just the violence and, and, the, and the advocation of violence, not just among you know, street thugs like Antifa, but all the way up into the Republic, into the Democratic Party at the very top. You know, advocate, openly advocate violence against conservatives. That's the future. The future is a communist, you know, basically a, a communist one-party uh, dictatorship in their head. They believe that's that's right. Yeah. That's what they're working for. You know, yeah. no inconsistency whatsoever in the way they treated the Covington kids or the way they treat uh, conservatives that want to go speak like Milo, want to speak at UC Berkeley. Yeah. It's all very consistent with saying we'll do. Yeah. You know, you know, a lot of the young folks. Because you're outside the party. Yeah, you know, the young folks coming out of school today, uh, they're all at you know at that age where they can be uh, tickled and attracted by uh, the temptations of free stuff of, of socialism, uh, but they do not relate to and have not been taught uh, the full evolution of this uh, because there is a necessary component of enforcement and violence. Uh, that is included in socialism as it matures, um, and they they're just not connecting with that. Um, you know, these kids are coming out of schools. It's heartbreaking. It's as hard uh, for someone like you or I to bring a just a, a simple constitutional message inside the walls of our schools, and these kids are coming out hating their country, begging for their own slavery. How frustrating yeah, you is that? You send a kid to school. I mean, this, this, this was certainly true for college. You send a um, bright, promising young kid to, to college, and you get back a, a America-hating communist. Mm -hmm. um, that's starting to happen in high school too. Yeah. You know, really, if you have kids in public school, you're screwing up. You should just pull them out and homeschool them. Yeah. Put them to a private, private academy, like a private Christian academy, or, or someplace where they can learn what how to think. Yeah, I, I, I try to empower uh, my listeners to that, too. We talked a bit about that a couple weeks ago. Is uh, It's gotten to the point of borderline child abuse to subject a child to what's going on inside these uh, government-run schools and the curriculums. Um, perversion is being taught in uh, the health classes, and, and that's the only way you can describe it. Um, but homeschooling, you know, there's a long-term and a short-term solution. I, I've become very active in the Constitution Party here in Massachusetts. And we've got a pretty clear position on government education. And, you know, on the long term, we really don't even need a Department of Education at all. We need to get it back in the hands of teachers and parents again. So uh, getting... Right. getting and the, and the, but the short term is, you, you know, look at where you live. I mean, you're, you're rearranging the deck chairs on, on, the, on the Titanic. Yeah. I'm not saying you shouldn't fight in your local school campus. <laughs> right, yeah. but, but you're... But you're doing that, look at it this way, you are doing that for your community as a whole. You're trying to save those kids. But your mm. own personal children? Pull them out. What are they doing in, in, in public school? Yeah. Right? So, so if you're listening to this, pull them out of public school. You can't get your neighbor, maybe you can't get your neighbor to pull their kids out of public school yet, but you can pull yours out. You sure. have no excuse for your kids being in public school. Yeah. And then go work on, the, on trying to, to correct the curriculum. You, you know, we're talking about many decades the left took over education. Yeah. They did. Yeah. They called it the long march. They did it. They, they took they took over education from top to bottom. It's owned by the left. Yeah. As far as public schools and colleges, with very few exceptions, it's predominantly, overwhelmingly Marxist, straight up communist. That's what they are. Yeah. 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 Are you seeing uh, any signs of a possible shift uh, from college back to trade at all? Kind of, I see a little hint of that once in a while. We certainly do need well, tradesmen you know, again. What's funny is, is that despite all of that, despite the brainwashing and the conditioning in these colleges, you still see 
young kids, because of the internet, catching a clue and, and realizing what's going on. Hence the, the walkaway movement. Mm. So you're still seeing it, which is why they got to use violence. They don't want Turning Points USA to be on a college campus yeah. because they're afraid of them. Because they understand that their crap, their their Marxist, you know, dogma, which is basically a, a radical religion, you know, their Marxist dogma will not stand up to someone like Jordan Peterson, for example, or anyone with, you know, uh, Ben Shapiro. You know, a logical, rational mind can pick it apart, especially by looking at Venezuela right now, right? Yeah. So you can pick it apart you know, as Exhibit A. Go back and read back the entire history of socialism, all the failed history of socialism and communism. Yeah. But they don't want an, an honest debate, which is why they do what they do. You're, you're, why they you're exactly right. Right. They, they lose, uh, to me, that's an admission that they've lost the uh, intellectual battle. Uh, when yeah. you you they shut down, care. yeah, you shut down just the the mere uh, opportunity of debate means that you have not got your argument in place. And, and you know, what is it uh, Socrates said that uh, the argument is lost when uh, uh, you, you t slander uh, becomes your first order of business or something like that. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's their strategy is to uh, not go into engage in and prevail in a debate, but to just simply shut it down. Um, okay. But it, it's it's starting to backfire. Of course, those hard lines, uh, I, I'm not going to you know talk to a brick wall anymore. Some of these people are too broken to fix and won't change their their mind. Even if uh, if Hillary Clinton went up on stage and ate a baby, uh, they would probably still support her. Um, right. So you don't waste your time with folks like that. But the walkaway movement, I knew these folks existed. I didn't know what type of an effort or organized uh, uh, movement would uh, bring them out. But I'm glad there is that attempt right now. There were a lot. This is why Trump's a uh, president, I believe, is he did have his bump. He did have a surge of people that were just furious with the way things had gone for eight years but at the same time hillary clinton really caused many of them just to keep their heads low she was an embarrassment they weren't buying into the lies and propaganda and there was an equal surge of people that stayed home democrats that did not vote there was two things that well, came together war democrats how could, how could an anti-war democrat vote for hillary yeah, you know she's 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 just as much of a, a, a war hawk as yeah. as anybody on the Republican side. Yeah, you know? she, she's very hawkish, and uh, um, yeah, so that's what I kind of think happened. I, there's a significant number of those Democrats out there, and I give them a pass. You know, I I enjoy beating up on uh, both main parties here, but um, I'm not just going to hate on uh, Democrats because they're Democrats because there are some uh, decent ones out there that realize their party apparatus has literally been infiltrated and gone uh, that's a good, broke. That's a good point. Like I've heard some, some conservatives you know, refer to Democrats as demon rats, things like that. And look, what you, what you have to realize is, as you said a minute ago, you know, the, the leadership is one thing. Now the rank and file, the guys that, you know, people that, Grew up voting Democrat because his dad was a Democrat. They were in the local union, you know, where they're a local teamster or something. You know, they're not dyed in the wool Marxists. So I think it's I think it's counterproductive to label them communists or or label them demon rats or things like that. Mm. You can say though, like you just said, the party's been taken over by radical Marxists, radical Marxists who hate this country. I think that's you know I think it's a fair assessment. It's a fair assessment. Yeah, that's who runs. The, look at Keith Ellison. You know, he used to be a communist, then he converted to Islam because he believed that Islam um, would further his goal, is what I, my perception of why he converted. So look at, uh, what's her name from Minnesota? Um, what's her name? Uh, I'm drawing a blank now. The ones in the news all the time. Oh, um. This, this all hot bar. She, you know, she, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I yes. I can't remember her name either. They were Marxists who. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, this is the weird intersection between Marxism and, and Islam. You know, they're, they're, they're Marxist Muslims, but they really are. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, people like that running the party. And then, and then Cortez being, being championed as the future of the party. What's that tell you? Right. I, I think she's just some raw meat. I think uh, the old callous uh, life career politicians 
are putting her forward. You know, if they make a little headway or get a little publicity on something, fine. But I think she's dispensable. I think she's a useless idiot, and they're playing her as such. She's gobbling it right up. Um, I, I see some apprehension in the Democrat apparatus in jumping on board with this Green New Deal, and, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm, I've been in opposition of uh, Agenda 21 for years, and I see this as a grand opportunity for us to— Oh, she's, uh, she's, a, she's a gift. Oh yeah, guess for us. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, think, I think you're right. Yeah, I, mean, she, I think with Napoleon and said, "Don't interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake." You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, it, so I, I say, let her get out there and cheerlead for him. Um, attack yeah, Bernie. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a dynamic duo. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to use it as opportunity. If they're going to put something out there and shine some light on it. Um, I'm going to get in that light because, as Senator Markey said, we're in that educational phase of the process right now where we educate people about the resolution. Well, we're, we're going to do exactly that. I'm glad she's uh, if she wants to stand right there in the spotlight, um, I say we give it to her. Um, she's not going to be able to sit there and call names, though. She's kind of, isn't someone like her kind of forced into a position where they um, have to at least try to engage in a cognitive debate i'm not saying no. she's going to prevail but no she, she's an ideologue i mean <laughs> you're never going to get an honest debate out of these people these, these radical ideologues they're always going to i mean they're, they're, they could be clever when they're debating i think they're pretty clever no but you're never going to get an honest debate out of them don't expect that <laughs> um, it's a battle but but, the, but here's here's what's good about a debate is that you could point out like you said you point out her absurdity of some of the things she's proposed and say this is and look what she just did with Amazon, right? Yeah, she just killed jobs in New York. So you can see this is the this is where the huh. mindset leads. It leads to poverty. It leads to <laughs> dysfunctional economic systems that just don't work. Look at Venezuela. Yeah, That's what it leads to. Yeah, look at Venezuela. Absolutely. Yeah. So we we have got a lot of enemies. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say we got a lot of enemies out there, uh, enemies within and enemies without. Um, Trump, without a doubt, you know, to bring things uh, full circle here, uh, I, I totally agree. We have had an influx that has had a ripple effect across this country, everything from vote integrity to just the financial uh, stress on our monetary system. And now uh, this caravan, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's millions in here and there's tens of thousands on their way. This is a little more sexy and newsworthy. Um, it's also being funded and put forward by uh, certain people in this world. I don't think this is an organic gathering of all those people. Um, but, you know, I've never seen it this bad. I've seen the country divided on things before, but never on so many things and never so polarized. Um, you know, what's going to give here? Well, yeah. I think we need to really focus on the corruption in the, in the, in the electoral system because I think it's, you know, they're, they're being so blatant and open about their intent. I mean, this, the, the absurdity of New York's or, or the, you know, the horror of New York's infanticide bill, and, and they're doing that across the country and other, other states. Why would they do that? Mm. I mean, they got to know it's going gonna, it's gonna to disgust, you know, millions of Americans who might have been in the middle somewhere, you know, to, you know your, your moderates and your, your, more, your more socially conservative Democrats you know, are going to be abhorred by it. They're crazy. Mm. They're crazy. So, so but, but that worries me because they apparently think it could just be just their arrogance, their own hubris. But it might be that they think they've got it rigged enough that they're going to win anyway. Mm. So that's what you have to watch for. That's why, you know, um, vote integrity, clean, clean elections is critical. In fact, that, that's, aside from the border, I'd say it's number two. Really, when it comes to the long-term ability to correct things politically, yeah. you've got to stop the flow of the illegals, and then you have to fix your electoral system. Yeah, I mean, I believe, I think we pretty much already accrued uh, what I've called before an unserviceable amount of debt. Um, even what we have already, I, I don't know. Is well, sure, but I'm talking about your ability to fix it, though. I mean, you yeah. can't fix any of that if, if they take over artificially in politics. No, I know. I, what I was saying in in terms of um, scale, you know, 
it, the vote integrity versus the economic impacts that the illegals have it is granted there's you know there's a an economic ripple effect that goes through the system and that's yeah. natural that accrues more debt something we've already in my estimation oh, we got having, massive. I mean, the, the, the national debt is, 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 is what is that? Is, what is it now? How many trillions of dollars now? Oh, I, I don't know. It, but, you know, I, we're talking over 30 something thousand dollars of debt that people are born into a baby today born into that amount of debt right. and it's, it's growing in, in orders of magnitude uh, I mean, we're going to be Venezuela at some point with our fiat currency we're going to be Venezuela in, in, a, in a sense no matter what we do you know what I mean? as far as that unpayable national debt that keeps compounding mm. you, you can't get around that we yeah. need like a jubilee basically and, you know, just to start a reset so at some mm. point we're going to have to face that do you think uh, Trump's going to wait till his second term if he uh, gets in in 2020 to uh, address things at the Fed? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't really don't know. Um, look, the unfortunate reality is, and I had William Dean off from Elitech the other day. I mean, when I was co-hosting on Alice Jones, I just kind of stacked it with people that were focused on the, on the immigration issue for good reason, I think. But um, William Dean came on and said, Guys, I hate to break it to you, but Trump signed a horrible budget bill. I mean, it gives a, pretty much a blanket amnesty to almost anyone who's an OTM because it says if you are the sponsor or that you are a possible sponsor of an unaccompanied child, then you are immune from being deported. Or if you're in a household with an unaccompanied child, you could be, you're immune from being deported. So basically, you give wide, you know, as far as like de facto amnesty to millions of people in the, that are already in the country because they can say, hey, I was an unaccompanied child living in this house. Mm. You can't deport them. Or I might be a sponsor for, for an unaccompanied child. Now, Trump can fix that in September with the next budget bill. But, you know, everyone's looking at this declaration of emergency. It's almost like sleight of hand. He got $1.6 billion, supposedly, for, for wall funding. You know, then, he, then he went ahead and signed it in exchange for that. And now he's going to declare an emergency to get more. And everyone's focused on that. He's not paying enough attention to what he signed. What he signed is, is open amnesty, basically, mm -hmm. for millions of people in, in, that are already illegally in the country. Wow. So when it comes to enforcement, he's been checked on in many ways. You know? yes. By his own hand. He signed it. Yeah. Yeah. So... We have to pressure him to fix that. So that, how do you do that? He's going to have to dig his heels in and say no to any expansion of the uh, scope of the already ridiculous asylum loophole. Yeah. 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 So it's not good. It's bad. I mean, Ann Coulter, she's a lot of flack because she turned on Trump, but she's been right about a lot of what she's saying. She's actually, when it comes to what he has done, she's right. Yeah. There's, you know, a lot of problems with what he's done. So a road to fix that, that's what we've got to make sure that he understands. He said you need to fix this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Now, you said Dr. Vieira was going to be uh, working on uh, some uh, documents to, to facilitate that. Did he give you a timeline on when he thought he'd, he'd have um, those ready? He, he can write it up. So as soon as it's done, we'll do our best to put that in Trump's hands. Um, hopefully, I'm not going to tell you how we're going to do that, but we're just, you know, yeah, we're going yeah. to try to work around any potential, I mean, it's just blunt, any potential traitors left on his staff. We're going to work around them. Yeah, so right. We'll do our best. Yeah, and yeah. the other big one is the red flag bills. I mean, we got to warn him the same thing. He cannot do that. Yeah. If he signs a red flag, national red flag law, he will lose, I would say, at least 10% of his base. Yeah, and I, I think so. That'll, that'll cook his goose if he does that, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah I mean, he's but already he made some, you know about He has made some very, very squeamish uh, comments about the Second Amendment, due process, and, uh, you know, it makes people cringe a little bit. I don't like to hear well, it. Um, in it's some not even just a comment. I mean, his administration, mm. um, like, officially supported red flag laws. Yeah. They said they called on Congress to fund red flag laws across the country. That's official policy. Yeah, yeah. So that's not, you know, I mean, he can, he can still fix that, but if he's, this is a bad indicator, put this way. Yeah. And the new attorney general was in favor of red flag bills. Yeah. And you got Lindsey Graham 
and, and you got Rubio now, two Republicans proposing a Republican, you know, bipartisan red flag bill. And that's when you know you're about to get screwed, right? When, when someone says bipartisan. Yeah. So because you got respected, prominent Republicans proposing this nonsense and his own attorney general, what do you think he's inclined to do? Yeah. You know, I, I think he's got uh, uh, some house cleaning still to do. The people around him bother me uh, uh, quite a bit. As I know he's not getting good advice on a, a few um, key issues and foreign policy type things. This is not going to be a winner for him if he continues to side with the left and compromise on these issues of the Second Amendment. Red so flag. He's on the red flag, though. It, it is the third rail for him. Yeah, I believe and, so. And, and make- let me make very clear about this. I know there's some, probably some primates out there saying, well, it shouldn't be that way. What do you want to do? And you know, Would you prefer Hillary win? That's not what I'm saying, that. What I'm saying is, is that as a matter of reality, mm-hmm. you, can, you, can, you can hold your nose and go vote for him if you want to, um, if he's under red flag bill. But I'm letting you know that I know hardcore gun owners all across the country will not vote for him. Yeah. They just will not. They're hardcore three percenters. Patriots, they simply will not. They don't trust the system. If he does that, they'll lose all faith in him and they'll just stay home. Yeah. It's just reality. You, you can, you can, you can, you know, cry about that all you want. It's not going to change reality. Yeah. So if you really want to help him win in 2020, you got to make sure that he understands that reality. You can't hide behind. Well, we don't want Hillary to win. So let's not criticize the president. I've heard this from some people. Yeah. Well, we shouldn't criticize the president. Let's, let's all get, get behind him. What's our alternative? Hey, I'm trying to keep him from getting his own throat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, silent consent's not ever worked for us. So, I and I've said this for uh, last week. I, I told people the same thing. You know, if you are a Trump supporter, do everything in your power to reach out through, you know, the apparatus, his campaign people, uh, call the the White House if you have to communicate to him because it means way more coming from a hardcore supporter, someone that voted for him, who currently says they support him, saying. You know, you, you may lose your your supporters if you continue this way. Uh, let him yeah, know. You will lose. You will lose. Like I, said, I, think, I think it's a fair statement to say you will lose 10% of your base. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's a, a very fair estimate, actually. Um, and 10% isn't something you want to throw away uh, in a political that's, climate that's like a, this. Look, look at how close the last election was. 10% of his base would be a game changer. That'd be it. Yeah, and that goes. I mean, and I'm not saying that that's what I want. I'm not, I'm not gloating. I'm just saying this is reality. Yeah, and yeah. Whether it's the border, the two issues he was, you know, he was the, the big ones that he has to keep his promises on is one, the border, two, gun rights. And either one of those are deal kill, deal killers. They really are. Yeah. You know. No. I mean, Texas was close, man. I mean, Texas almost went for Hillary. It was close. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, now, we've uh, done a good job of touching uh, base on that. Um, is there anything from your uh, discussion with Edwin Vieira that you'd like to share out there? How long are you going to be in Texas? Um, what's up for the Oath Keepers? What's, uh, who's activated? What's going on down there uh, in the coming yeah, weeks? Texas. I mean, Texas is a capable state. I mean, South California, it has the largest number of college for professional and it was close. I mean, you know, he almost had, Tree was almost beaten by, by Beto down here in Texas. So uh, it's a critical state, and, you know, basically as goes Texas is, is going to be as goes the United States, that's what I think. So that's why I'm here working with uh, Texas legislators like Kyle Peterman. He's got an important uh, memorial protection bill also. In fact, the big issue is their left assault on the memorials, including the, including the Alamo, in fact. They want to just kind of like get the Alamo as far as being a historic battle um, on it, make it more about just being a mission, you know, among all the other missions going back 800 years. So it's just, this, this is a culture war. Um, but the big thing in Texas is I really do think Governor Abbott can really help the president out by declaring an emergency in Texas. And so a big part of why I'm here is the build some momentum to push him to do that um, and also Good. to fund that bill. Yeah. I think if Texas, because Texas has the largest section of border in the United States, if Texas built its own wall, that's something, even if the Dems take over, the left takes over you know, nationally, they can't undo that. It, it would belong to Texas. What are they going to do about that? Nothing. Yeah. 
So I think it's a it's a no brainer and also incredibly important for Texas to step up and secure its own border. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would encourage folks who live in Arizona. We have so we have on, on March second we have a rally. Uh, we have a rally slash um, vigil in Texas and in California, and we're scouting for a, a proper location in Arizona as well. And if we can do it, we'll do it in New Mexico. But the idea really is just to show support for the president, the declaration of emergency. But yes, we do need the military down here. Encourage him to go all the way to deploy the military and build the wall with DOD resources. Yeah. Um, at the same time, encouraging our governors, like in Texas and, and Arizona in particular, to step up and declare an emergency also to support the president. Or whatever parallel they would use in their state, whatever makes the most sense. Make it clear that yes, we agree with his assessment, and we're going to do all we can as the you know, the commander in chief in the state to step up and protect our people. Nice. Um, and so that's that's the main point of it is that you see show support for the president because right now of course the left is attacking him. The left is so much better organized than the right. People on the political right, you know, they can't seem to get organized do anything. Yeah, they're well, slow to warm up to the technology and everything. Uh, you're exactly right there. The the Democrats, boy, they get up in the morning. They the first thing they do, they do a thousand push ups just in just thinking of ways to mess with Republicans. The, the, the well, technology I mean, don't just. Of course, they've got Soros. I mean, this, this is one of the other problem I see on uh -huh. the political right is the left has Soros and other extremely wealthy leftists, you know, funding all these organizations. Yeah, we yeah. don't have that a counterpart on the right for whatever reason. We don't have wealthy, wealthy Republicans and wealthy conservative businessmen will donate to campaigns, but they don't donate to grassroots organizations. They just don't. Yep, yeah. you know? growing I pains of globalization. Uh, there's all kinds of growing pains of globalization, and this is just one of them. Is that those who really do seek to rule the world. Um, have the money to influence uh, things. I'm not going to the Republicans off the hook that fast. There's plenty of wealthy conservatives out there, who are millionaires and billionaires, who are just not donating what yeah. they should be to the, the groups on the right. Mm. They, can, they can actually put people on the ground, like us. Yeah. But not just us, other groups too. Yeah. So, mm. you know, they've got Soros, but on our side, the Coast Brothers are in favor of wise Forest. So who's on our side? Yeah. You know? Now, uh, oh, yeah. if you got a website, people can uh, check in and keep track of what you got going on and uh, get reports. Sure, yeah, they can go to oathkeepers.org. And in fact, right now we're doing a membership sale um, to help us raise funds. But you know, hey guys, come donate. I mean, I'm not going to be too proud to ask. You know, you donate ten bucks, you're never going to miss it. Yeah. It's going to help us tremendously. Amen. Or if you want, join. You can join for seven bucks a month as a Liberty Tree sustaining member helps fund what we do and, and gives you a chance to be a member and, and know that you're supporting the cause. So come sign up. And, and if you do, right now we have several different drawings for either annual Liberty Tree or lifetime membership for different prizes, all of them firearms. So Ooh. pretty cool stuff. All right. Excellent. All right, and that's it. Yeah, we, have, we, we have like half a million followers on Facebook. If, if all of them actually joined Oath Keepers, we'd be doing just great. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's a lot of looky-loos out there. we got to stay persistent, yeah, lead yeah. by example, and uh, liberty through acclamation. They'll, they'll eventually come yeah. on board when they, when they finally get pinched. You know, they'll get pinched by something someday and realize it might be time to stand it'll, it'll up. It'll probably be a red flag right in their house. And all of a sudden, they'll be like, oh, man, I should have joined. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Excellent. So that's <laughs> oathkeepers.org. Uh, folks can uh, go in, check in there, get updates on what's going on currently down in uh, Texas along the border. Membership uh, and Arizona, information. California. Yeah, we should be announcing by tomorrow, I hope, um, our, our latest locations for rallying in California and Arizona. So just uh, check, check the website for that. Excellent. Uh, can you? Uh, you must have a YouTube channel too and stuff. Can you uh, post some updates here as our interview goes out? Uh, keep me updated. I like to keep some fresh information on some of the things we talked about. Um, post them up here in the text chat. We had a lot of folks to tune in tonight to hear you, and I uh, really appreciate you very much uh, taking out some time here on a Sunday evening to come talk with us. Anytime, man. I look forward to doing it again. In fact, um, next weekend I'll be live streaming from the border on Saturday, which is actually March the second. Is Texas Independence Day too? Oh, man. so we picked a good day for that. So we'll be out there, and the next day on Sunday, uh, Kyle Biederman will be out there with us, and we'll do a live stream of him as well. And if you want, 
we can, you know, maybe we can get your your channel up on the same live stream. We, we can figure out how to do that. Wow. Oh, that'd, that'd be uh, real exciting. I love to uh, participate in that. Thank, Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, Stuart. You bet. Thank you. God bless you too. All, All right. right. Have a good Amen. night. Now, thank you so much. Bye bye. Excellent. Well, that was a uh, um, very uh, interesting discussion, uh, and it kind of w- went in the direction I expected. I, I knew there were uh, some things with uh, you know this order and the way it was done, um, and and I understand his urgency. I, I I understand the president's urgency because this is a profound problem, has an economic impact. Um, there's just simply people being killed. I don't care if they're uh, drunk driving accidents, shot dead in the street, uh, drugs they bring in. Um, you know, people are being killed, uh, including Mexicans that are falling into prostitution, drug rings, or just drove out in the desert and left to cook in a, a box Awful, truck. Horrible. Um, you know, there's a lot, almost nothing but bad uh, occurs with this illegal, um, and I almost said illegal immigration. Um, you know, there, there's almost no such thing. If you want to immigrate, you knock on the door and follow the immigration process. Uh, anything else, you're an illegal alien, illegal invader. Um, I know three people have come in the right way. And, and they're probably wonderful, productive. They are. Uh, strength uh, to the country, too. Because uh, I, I know uh, uh, quite a few people like that yeah. from all over, you know, different uh, Norway and, I mean, you're all England, over in Europe, Mexico. Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've got family that has uh, done that. My, my sister-in-law. Yes. So, yeah, you know, this is uh, not about keeping people out. It is about maintaining the strength of this country while we bring in uh, those that have a thirst for liberty and freedom. Stuart wants to know if uh, were there any questions I forgot to answer. Um, I think I was picking them up as we went, Stuart. Um, there, if there's some in there, please feel free to jump into the chat. Um, add in uh, any links and stuff, any questions we might have missed. Um, but I tried to keep up as we went. I uh, really uh, appreciate you again coming on and uh, what you're doing there. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working with with Oath Keepers over the years. Oh, uh, well, you know, I've taken the oath a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Uh, I know a lot of people that have. Um, in fact, Stewart was out there. He was one of our guest speakers uh, at the Second Amendment rally. Or, I saw him. Uh, yeah, oh, he, he's yeah. one of the, the veterans of the rally. As you see, we got the uh, banner up there. Is we are um, we're still moving right along. We got great things going on. Um, uh, you know, the, the rally is going to be pressing forward. Um, wonderful guest speakers this year, and I, I just can't wait. This is going to be really exciting. What do you, What do you think? Always. Oh, what do you mean? You talk about your rally? Yeah, Second Amendment rally. Absolutely. It's in, a, it's, it's in a new venue. It's going to be a hoot. It's going to be at the Century, Century Sportsman's, Sportsman's Club, Club in Auburn, Massachusetts this year. A very pretty setting. You know, Chris very Ann nice. Hall. Yes. We got Tom DeWeese. Now, Tom DeWeese is something interesting I can't here. wait to meet him. Um, he was on our show a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, got over 11,000 views. This is resonating. This Agenda 21, Green New Deal stuff is resonating with people. Um, he's also going to be at the rally, as you know. Um, but he's going to be one of the guest speakers as well at our uh, meeting. The Constitution Party's having another uh, board oh. of directors meeting in May. Where, where is that? Um, I can't remember what state that's in. It's a little bit closer. It was in Texas the last time. It was. Yeah, but I, I've got Dal- a, Dallas, right? Um, yeah. Yes, yes, Dallas, Fort Worth area. So, yeah, he's going to be speaking there uh, to uh, my uh, colleagues at the Constitution Party, which I think is just wonderful. Um, as you know, the Constitution Party actually speaks very definitively about these foreign entanglements international uh, entities, the United Nations, and Agenda 21 specifically. Uh, the party speaks specifically to that, and they're very much in opposition to it and in favor of property rights. Yes. So, yeah. You you know a lot about property rights, don't you? I am still a student of that stuff. I don't know enough yet. I, I This is one of those things, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. Um, mm. But the, our population is lacking a very fundamental attachment to their uh, an understanding of the importance of property rights. 
they're very quick to give up something that is so, so critically important. The Second Amendment. They can't take your gun away for two reasons. There's a Second Amendment that uh -huh. speaks to it, but they can't take your property. Not unless no. they, they they take you to a court of competent jurisdiction, right. a jury of your peers uh, listens to the evidence, convicts you, and, and removes that, that right from you rightfully. So, yeah, I don't Oops. know. This is kind of funny. Um, but, yeah, our... Um, yeah, I'm getting to that, actually. Um, <laughs> I mentioned we got a meeting coming up with the Constitution Party uh, is having a board meeting. Really good things are happening. I, I'm going to be on this Wednesday, uh, Constitutionally uh, Correct, which is uh, uh, one of the regional vice presidents, uh, Randy Stuffelbeam's uh, show. So I'm going to be on with him this Wednesday as he's on his way to CPAC. We're going to talk a little bit. Right. Um but I got to get my carcass out to that board meeting. So we're going to be doing a little bit of fundraising, and we wanted to have a little bit of fun as we did it. Jamie said, please announce tomorrow, February 25th, 11 a.m., climate change press conference. Yes, yes. Mentioned that uh, earlier. Massachusetts um, State House. The uh, uh, Camp Constitution House, Charlotte has got a great presentation. At Nurses Hall, hosted by Camp Constitution, yes. Yeah, you got it. All right. Good, Amen. Good job. Did a great job oh, on that. 11 o'clock. Yeah. So, you know, we all know climate change happens. Climates do change. They're supposed to change. Governments, once their scientists realize the long-term patterns of pretty much anything, they can predict what it's going to do. They can regulate that prediction and monetize that prediction. That's what they've happened here. I really oversimplified it, but that's kind of what's going on. So I posted a link up there, folks, and that is uh, because we're going to have a fun little raffle. One of the we things, are. A couple of years ago uh -huh. um, when uh, we had uh, the Second Amendment rally again, right. um, we had Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Well, that's why up. I came out, and that's what that's the first time I ever saw that's you. A, yeah, that's uh, uh, what kicked it off, and here we are. Yeah, here we are. I had my picture taken with him. I came out to your rally because I found out he was going to be there, and I, you know, dig the guy. So. And I met my most beautiful wife in the world there. Ah. Uh, I did. I said, thank you, Joe Arpiles. He did wonderful <laughs> things already. Well, uh, yeah, what a great old guy, man. Every time we talked, uh, we were on the phone for an hour or so. Um, but when he got up here, I put him right to work. And okay. Got, and my aunt, God, I love my aunt. She, uh, she's always doing, there's experimenting on me with some new goodies that she's cooking and whatnot. Right. Well, I got in a pinch and I said, I have got to have something really oh. cool for folks. Oh, that's right. She tinted them. Yes. What the heck? So I went out, got a whole bunch of tidy whities and my aunt sat next door and, um, she dyed them all pink. And when Sheriff Joe showed up, he got there a little bit early and went and sat down, said hi to him, and uh, right. we were kind of hanging out. And, and I show up with a great big bag and a couple of Sharpies. And one of the things that Sheriff Joe did for me was he autographed a bunch of pink underwear. Right, but you have to explain why that there are pink underwear. Okay. Sheriff Joe is uh, is famous for, you know, he's America's toughest sheriff for a reason. And when uh, the inmates in, in the prisons that he was overseeing, they were stealing the underwear and the clothes and stuff. And he said, well, the hell with this. And he dyed them all pink. He said, let them steal that bunch of sissies. And um, it worked for a <laughs> while. It worked for a while, but it eventually backfired as... Uh, you know, Joe became famous for, uh, you know, his, his position on reforming these convicts. Uh, they they lived in tent cities and they, you know, dug ditches and broke rocks and things like that. Um, and he became famous. And then the inmates realized that these pink underwear were actually worth a lot of money. And they were eBaying them and things like that. So he had to stop doing that just because... Uh, the inmates monetized his pink underwear <laughs> and stopped stealing them. Just to, They're not know. stupid. But you get to benefit. Uh, we wanted to have a little fun. We wanted to try to raise some money um, uh, to get my carcass out uh, to this important meeting, uh, the National Board of the Constitution Party. So, yeah, we're not just going to sit there and, and beg, but what we are going to do is try to make it fun. 
What I had stashed oh, yes, away please help. is a little bag full be great. with a few more. Huh? Huh? Oh, huh? my gosh. Autographed pink sheriff Sh shows. Show the front. What? It's just got the, the little thing for your yeah, finger to come out. Show the front. There's will nothing ya? there. There's no autograph there. That's horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I could actually do the show without pants on. No one knew. I was wearing no, pink underwear no, they did until not. then. You know that? <laughs> this is unbelievable. So everyone, oh, Lord, uh, the high heavens. <laughs> everyone who pitches in, forgive us. Uh, any donation anyway. or contribution of uh, twenty dollars or more, uh, we're gonna uh, take your name, put it on a ticket in a jug. We're gonna send you that number. You, you got to come back to the Red Pill <laughs> Politics page, and uh, we'll send that number to you. But you, this raffle, when we do uh, do it, don't have to be present to win. Whoever it is, uh, we're going to know. We're going to contact you. And uh, you're going to get yourself an autographed pair of pink Sheriff Joe underwear. So that's kind of what we got going on. I had a couple more left. I don't know uh, when or if ever I'll ever be able to get Sheriff Joe back here uh, to autograph some more for How us. How many do you have? I, you know, I used to have a pretty good bag full, but, you know, that was the way I, I thank people who helped out with a rally. Um, we did some other raffles as we did fundraisers <laughs> to uh, buy airfare tickets and whatnot. Right. But, you know, I thought this was a special occasion. Red Pill politics is uh, <laughs> kind of important. Stuart too. Rhodes says that is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, well, no, no. He said that is horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we got a. Uh, we're gonna keep it lively. We're gonna keep it fun. We're gonna keep and, it fun. Uh, we, we try. I, I promise. As, uh, <laughs> as we move forward with the Constitution Party, and that's what I love about what we're doing, uh, is uh, we are the least political political party. You know, um, that's a good point. You know, we don't lean. We stand. We're not oh. going to lean one way or the other. Uh, we're going to stand. We're going to stand on that the Constitution. That is a really great coined phrase. Isn't it? I, I thought like of it. that today all by myself. You're kidding. All by myself. What? 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 Can you imagine? It just came wow. together. So right. I need to write it down. Say it again. I, I, something about leaning and standing. We'll, we'll, we'll get it. We're going to get it. We're strengthening these parties in the state. Um, I've got just a conversation today, this morning, I had... Uh, gives me a lot of optimism for a couple of the abutting states uh, that we've been yes. working with. So lots of good stuff going on there. Uh, this little raffle, just a fun way uh, to say thank you to the donors uh, and to, to help offset these expenses. Uh, we took a pretty good hit the last Let's time. Let's have some fun. But what a productive meeting we had, and I'm looking forward yeah. to this one, too. Oh, my God, that was a good meeting. Constitutionally you correct. Spoke awesomely i'm not gonna lie well thank you so much sweetie pie yeah no really it was great so yeah um i'm hoping we're gonna have another productive meeting out there the last one things went really well we were uh, ratified here in massachusetts we were oh. um, do you know how exciting that is yeah we had a really good showing out there granted. made great connections we got resources coming in for 2020 uh ballot access that's right all right folks that's uh, important we are gonna get her done we are going to get her done. Right on. Yeah. So what do you think, uh, sweetie pie? Uh, we didn't beat up on your um, your your President Trump too badly, did we? I, I did learn some things, and uh, you know I'm a little slightly alarmed, and uh, I'm I took note. So, you know I'm going to call I'm going to call his line. I think you should. You know I'm going to call his line. So you know I I don't blame them when they tune out these people that just lose their uh, uh, their stuff. Um, you know, you tune out something too broken to fix, and you you can't reason with them or talk to them, so you know, let it go. But people like you, as supporters, uh, they need to. You, you, he needs to hear from you. So I'm reaching out. You know, the others, you go ahead and and uh, reach out to his team. Let him know where he is screwing up. If he's going to make process uh, progress in draining the swamp, which I yes. would like to see him do, I want to see indictments and convictions. All right, tall tree, short rope, all that good stuff. Um, but he's going to need consistency in himself, consistency in the Constitution, and consistency in the support around him. Correct. Um, so we want what's best uh, for the country, Constitution first and always. My computer is, is going hooey. Oh, that's right. We're at the end of the show. 
we're at that point where I say, fly your flags high and keep your powder dry. That's right. And love each other out there. That's right. Have a good night, folks. Patriots. Thanks for tuning in. That's